Good morning. Yeah. See, I can get them to say things. So I just realized that, right? Okay, for those of you who might be saying, man, Andrew looks really good with a shaved head. All right? As much as I've been trying to get him to go to this look, it hasn't happened yet. No. My name is Patrick, and uh, you normally find me back there, but Pastor Andrew and his family are taking some much-needed rest. Um, today is Pastor Andrew's birthday, yes. So we could all, well, if we had a wide shot, we could all turn around and sing happy birthday to him. But we're not going to do that. But today is Andrew's birthday. He's taking some much needed rest. And you're stuck with me this morning. I'm waiting to see how many people started walking out the door when I said that. No. All right. And, and this has been a great series, right? I mean, this has been such a fun series. This more than a feeling series. And I can't tell you how tempted I was this morning to play the song, but I know Facebook would have been all over us if we would have played it. But like all since he told me the name of the series, I have had that Boston song stuck in my head. Anyone else, right? In the first week, of course, we looked at anger. And man, that's, that one hit home for me. And then we looked at apathy in that week too. And last week was probably my favorite one. Because when he told me what the topic was, when he said it's going to be grief, I thought, how on earth is he going to stand up on stage and talk about death for 45 minutes? Because when you think grief, right, that's what you think, right? Funerals and dying and stuff like that. And was anybody else really moved by the way he presented that last week? I mean, I know I was. I, I, I never would have in a million years taken grief in that direction. If you haven't had a chance to watch it, you can do so over on the, um, the YouTube channel for um, the church here. And this week, you know, he was making those really cool signs, right? The little paper plates. And I actually have them back in the booth. And he's like, if you want to use them, you can use them. If you don't want to use them, that's fine. Well, I said, you know what? I, I don't have kids to make those for me. And, and I don't have the skills to make those. I, I, I don't have, if you would have seen me draw something, it would have been a stick person. Or it would have been crooked. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and use this for the emotion today. All right. So, so does anybody want to guess what today's emotion is? You're close. Joy. Yes. Yes. Today's emotion is going to be joy. And as we talk about joy today, there's a couple questions I want to keep in mind, right? I want to get a baseline here of what exactly joy is. So as pastor does, we're going to get the textbook definition first from dictionary.com. The emotion of great delight or happiness caused by something exceptionally good or satisfying. Now, the thing about dictionary.com, though, is they don't just have one definition. The expression or display of glad feelings, a state of happiness. All three of those. So as you can see by those definitions, it's both an inward and an outward emotion. It's both something that you do inside of you, but it's also something that is shown as you go out as well. Joy is one of those things where people should be able to see it. People should be able to see it 100% of the time. If you're joyful, people should be able to tell when they meet you for the entire time that they know you. But the basic question, really, we have to ask as we get a baseline for today's message is, what brings joy into your life? Where do you find joy in your life? Now, for me, it's a couple different things, I'll admit it. It's finding a new artist to listen to in music. That's one of the things that I find joy. I can just sit staring out a window with headphones on for hours and it feels like minutes if I find something good that I listen to. And then the second thing is the beach. All right? I am a beach bum stuck in West Virginia. All right? I, I, I was joking with someone someone yesterday that I sometimes have trouble even putting socks on because I'm so irritated I have to wear them. Right? No, because they look cool. That's why I like the Crocs. Okay, no. But, that, <laughs> but, but that's, that's, the, that's where I find joy in my life, are those two things. The guys will tell you. And when they come into my office, normally I have beach sounds playing in there because that's just 
the places that I find joy in my life. But there's another question as we're going through the scripture today that we need to ask as well, besides where do you find joy in your life? The other question we need to ask and the other thing we need to keep in mind is where are you overlooking areas of joy in your life? See, it's very easy to identify where we get joy from. If you have children, if you have a family, most likely that's going to be your first answer. Right? But where are the areas that you should be looking for joy, but don't? And as we look at the scripture today, I think you're going to see a whole lot of these areas in your life as we go about it. So, if you want to follow along, we're going to be in Luke 15 today. And Luke 15 actually has three parables in it. And three of them are kind of well-known, all right? The one we're going to look at is the most well-known one, well-known one. We have the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and both of those deal with joy. Both of those deal with losing something and then finding it, right? But the one we're going to look at is probably one of the most well-known parables in the Bible, which is the parable of the prodigal son. And that's where we're going to be spending most of our time today, is in that parable, all right? And before we get going, the one thing we have to remember, and the one thing we have to have as the overarching view as we look at this parable, is that our joy should be found in the things of God, no matter what our circumstances are. Should not be concentrated on the worldly things, which we are going to talk about here but it should always be going back to the things of God. That's where we should find our joy. That's where we should be looking for it at all times. Let's go ahead and dive into the scripture, shall we? Start at verse 11 of Luke 15. And it says, he also said, he being Jesus. This is Jesus telling the parable. A man had two sons. The younger, the younger one of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that I have coming to me. So he distributed the assets to him. Let's take a look at this. What's the son really doing here? What's the son actually saying? Well, the son's saying, Dad, you're dead to me. Give me what you would give me normally if I was at your funeral right now because I don't want anything more to do with you. I'm going to take it and I'm going to go. And then the son what? Son just wants the money, right? So what does that tell you? Well, the son does not find joy in his family. See, if he found joy in the family that he was in, he would not be doing this. He's finding joy, what? In the material things of the world. He says, this is where I can get my joy from, is these things of the world. You give me the money, and I can go find my joy outside of the family, outside of what we have built here. And this story in particular, for those of you who know my history, and I'll talk about it throughout the day, hits home. Because I've done this. Now, not the money part, but I've done this. I've cut the entire family out before. So I can definitely see where this son is coming from. So let's go ahead and move on. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together all he had, and he traveled to a distant land where he squandered his estate with foolish living. Um, I like to put the modern day spin on this a little bit so you can really understand what he did. He basically took all of his money to Vegas and blew it. Okay. That's the easiest way to describe what's happening here. And he didn't blow it by giving it to charity out there. All right? He blew it on gambling, on women, on whatever other vice you can name. That's what when it says foolish living, and other translations have it different ways, that's what it's talking about. Is that what he did was he was finding joy and in instant gratification of the world. He was going out and saying, okay, I got what I want. Now I'm going to go get it, and it's going to make me happy. And it's going to do so instantly. Raise your hand if you've ever pulled this one. 
right? Every time I buy a new iPad, mm -hmm, right? Every time you hit Amazon, well, I, I can't not buy it because I'm going to save money if I buy it. Someone really is going to have to explain that theory to me one time, right? But this is, those are small examples, but this is what we do, right? We want the thing now. And then what happens? When we buy something on Amazon and it says it's two-day delivery, I was just talking about this with Todd before I came up here. Why am I paying for two-day delivery when it takes them three days to ship it? I get mad. Why? Because it's not instant. We live in a world where we want an instant, and you can see that's what this child did even back 2,500 years ago, was he wanted the instant thing. He's like, I'm going to get it now. I'm going to get all the joy I have now, and I'm going to take it all in right now. We have to be very careful of doing this. Why? Well, after he'd spent everything, the severe famine struck that country, and he had nothing. Then he went out to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. Pause for a minute. This would have been one of the most lowly jobs on the planet at the time. This would have been a horrifying job, and you got to remember who Jesus is telling this story to. He would have been telling it to a large group of Jewish people. So imagine the impact this job would have had as he's telling it to them. Why? Right? Jews consider pigs very unclean and dirty. So he's saying this guy had to go out and do one of the lowliest jobs possible, feeding the pigs, and he longed to eat his fill from the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one would give him anything. They wouldn't even let him eat what he was feeding the pigs. I mean, talk about having nothing. He went from having all this money to now one of the lowliest jobs on the planet, and they won't even give him what he is feeding the pigs. But what can we find here? What do we see here? Joy and instant gratification will have undesired consequences. When we go out and we do these things for instantly, what are we doing? We're not thinking long term. We're not thinking, how is this going to affect me tomorrow, next week, so on and so on and so on. Right? And this is what this kid did. I have all the money. I have no family now because I've already renounced it because I took all the money. And then I went and blew all the money. And now I have nothing. Once again, I've been there. I've done this. And it's not a pleasant situation to be in. And the reason it's not a pleasant situation to be in is because you feel you have no place to go. As he's sitting there feeding the pigs, he literally feels, I have no place to go. What am I going to do? In my case, I took it to an extreme. He luckily doesn't. When he came to his senses, I love that expression. Right? When he finally woke up, when he finally came out of the fog and realized how dumb he had been. That's the Patrick translation. Right? He said, how many of my father's hired workers have more than enough food, yet here I am dying of hunger? Now, most likely, he's thinking back to the people that I'm going to assume he probably didn't treat too well when he was around his father, right? And he's thinking back going, man, those people, I didn't treat that well at all. Think of all the food they have, and I'm here starving to death. I'll get up. Go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired hands. Now we're going to start talking about godly joy. See, up to this point, we've been talking about things of the world, right? 
We've been talking about that instant gratification and wanting it now and taking what you want. Now we're going to start talking about godly joy. And how do you start talking about godly joy? Godly joy is found in humility. See, this son was brazen enough to go to his dad and say, give me my inheritance because you're dead to me. And now he has to go and humble himself before him. This is the picture of us with Christ every day, isn't it? I've run away. You might not run away like this kid did, but every time we sin, we step away. And every time we sin, we need to humble ourselves and go back to him. Because this is where we start finding the real joy. This is where the godly joy starts, is when we're willing to admit humbly that we have made the mistake. That we have sinned against God. So what happens? Well, so he got up and went to his father. But while the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. And he ran, threw his arms around his neck, and kissed him. Now this next slide is going to throw a lot of you all off. I just woke up half the room by saying that, I got a feeling. Godly joy should not be bound by the perception of society. Now, I'll give you all a minute to think, what on earth is Patrick talking about? Well, go back to this verse here, all right? So he got up, and while he was a long way off, the father started running towards him. In Jewish culture, in Jewish society, it was completely and totally shameful and humiliating for a male to run. For a male to run was seen as a sign of weakness and was seen as a shameful and humiliating act. So as this father sees the son off, he starts running towards him. Our joy should not be bound by what society says you should and shouldn't do in terms of how do we respond in godly joy. We should be joyful for God in every situation we're in, no matter what. And as we get towards the end here today, you're going to see why this matters a whole lot. A whole lot. So keep this in mind as we move forward. The son, said, oops. the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Sinned against heaven and no longer worthy to be called your son. Truly repentant heart will bring about godly joy. Starts with humility, right? Starts acknowledging and humbling yourself in the faults that you have before God. But then you actually have to do something about it. You can't just say, yep, here's what I messed up. Here's the big list of things that I've done wrong. Now, where can I go do them again? See, that's not. Repentance. That's not having a truly repentant heart. And the son, look what the son says. He goes to him and says, I have sinned against you. He admits it. And then look what he says at the end. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's repentance right there. I know I've done wrong and I've done such a bad thing that I don't even deserve to be called your son. That's how we should be going to God. Why? Because that will where godly joy stems from. Is knowing you are in a right relationship with God. Is knowing that your life is on the track He wants you to be on. And not just continuing to do the things we want to do, but falling in line with what He wants us to do. See, the instant gratification, the worldly joy that we think we need over and over again, it's going to fade, right? It's going to go away just like that. 
Ask anyone who had money in the stock market in 2008 how quickly it'll go away. Okay? Ask anyone who's going through some type of disaster who might have lived in Florida or South Carolina when one of the hurricanes hit. Might have lived in New Orleans during Katrina. Those type of things will go away just like that. Godly joy will not. Because you are always resting in him for everything. Let's go on. But the father told his servants, quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put on a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Then bring the fatted calf and slaughter it. And let's celebrate with a feast. Because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. What do we take from this? God is joyous when we return to him. See, we get godly joy by doing the right things. And we get godly joy by having our life fall in line with what God wants. But God gets joy when we come back to him. Look, he says, quick. There's no hesitation, right? Quick, go do this. And then he says what? They began to celebrate. They begin, yes, he's come back to us. God gets joy when we return to him. We have to keep that in mind as we go about this. So, now his oldest son was in the field, and as he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he summoned one of the servants, questioning what these things mean. Your brother is here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered the fatted calf because he is back and safe and sound. Let's pause for a moment here and do a quick review of what we have seen so far. The son had no joy in his family, right? Didn't have any joy in the family. He tries to find joy in the things of the world. Gets all the money, goes out. Discovers humility. and is joyfully welcomed back by the Father. Right? So, what emotion should the older brother be showing at this point? Yes! My brother's back. He's come back into the fold, right? Woohoo! The first person that says that looks like me is in trouble, by the way. All right? Yes, as Christian as Christians, those things I just went over should make us overjoyed when we see somebody coming back into God's family, right? We should be running around yelling and screaming and telling everybody, hey, you remember that guy that we had the issues with a couple years ago? You remember that addict that we were trying to bring into church that couldn't come and refused to come? Well, he's accepted Christ. And he's coming into the family. We should do this when we see someone coming back to God. All right? We don't, though, do we? And I haven't even got to the brother's response yet. I'm talking about we don't. Right? And I know we don't because eight years ago, as I was walking out of the jail and starting to get back on the social media and social accounts, people that were in the church, not this church, right? But I know that we're going to church, would throw out things like, glad to see he's covering up what he did with the Bible. He doesn't really mean what he's saying. Right? I still get it to this day. Eight years later, I still get it. Oh, he's still using that Bible as a shield for what he did. 
Trust me, I ain't that good of an actor. All right? But we have that attitude, right? What are we doing? We're saying he is not good enough to be a Christian because I've been in church 30 years. Right? Anybody else have that attitude? And you might not even admit you have that attitude. It might just be subconsciously. Right? You might just see somebody and go, there's, there's no way. You know? No, no, I know how much that person drinks. There's no way what they're saying is right. I work in a building that has 40 to 50 men that get that said about them every day. There's no way. Oh, that's the building's just full of alcoholics and drug addicts. Hear it every day. And I'm standing right there with them going, well, yeah, there are addictions in the building. There are problems in the building. Doesn't mean we judge them. Why? Because we want this. We want to walk out going, we got another one saved. Another one's returned home to the Father. Right? And we all know that's this oldest son's reaction. He's, he's overjoyed and runs back and talks to his brother, right? We all know that's how the story ends. If anybody has a Bible that has that ending in it, please throw the Bible away. All right? Then he became angry. Not that, oh man, he's back. I got to give up the good room now. No. He became angry and didn't want to go in. So his father came out to him and pleaded with him. Notice this. God comes out to you when you do this. He is going to come to you and he's going to talk to you and he's going to say, what are you doing? Why are you not happy that someone has gotten saved? Why are you not happy that this person wants to be baptized? Well, I know what that person's past is. And he, he. So? Do you have a past? Raise your hand if you have a past. Raise your hand if you have a perfect past that God, you've done everything God... Yeah, the hands went down quick, didn't it? Mm-hmm. That's what God's saying, right? He's pleading with them. And he replied to his father, Look, I have been slaving many years for you, and I have never disobeyed your orders. <laughs> Let's just pause on that one for a minute, right? Like we talked about last week, right, with the rich young ruler. Jesus lists all the commandments except for the one. I've done all those. What else I got to do? I'm good. I've done all that. Look what he says here. I've obeyed all of your orders. Yet you never gave me a goat that I could celebrate with my friends. Mm. There's envy, jealousy, and all kinds of other ease I can name coming out in this statement, isn't there? And once again, we do these kind of things. We don't intend to. We might not do it as blatantly as this person does, but we do it. But when this son of yours, he doesn't even acknowledge him as family. Doesn't even say, when my brother, who messed up, he just says, when this son of yours, are you unwilling to accept somebody into the family of God because they don't fit into the mold of what you think a Christian should be? Because that's what he's doing right here. This son of yours, I don't want to have anything to do with him. He's not part of my family. Because of what he did, he's not part of my family. There's no joy here, right? But when this son of yours, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you, slop, you slaughtered the fatted calf for him. And here's a couple things we have to keep in mind as we read this passage, right? First off, the older son has nothing to lose. 
You have nothing to lose by being joyful for someone who comes into God's family. Nothing. Remember, go back to the slide, and I can't go back because it's too far back, but go back to the slide. Our joy should not be based on what society says we should be doing. Our joy should be based on what God says we should be doing. The son has nothing at all to lose by saying, I am so glad he is home. Well, he has a little bit to lose, right? Because he sees it as a pride issue. He sees it as a jealousy issue. But he only gains something when the younger brother returns. He gains a brother back, right? He gains a family member back. And that's how we need to look at it. Every time somebody walks through our doors, um, look, eh, they're not a Christian because of how they dress. For those of you who follow my podcast know that I have a big issue with that, right? They're not a Christian because they have tattoos. I don't. I don't want needles. You're never going to see that on me, don't worry. They're not a Christian because fill in the blank. Guess what? We're playing the part of the older brother here. We're taking the joy away from somebody who is deep in godly joy. So, what can we take from the older brother here? What application can we take away from this? Godly joy chooses community over competition. We want as many people in God's community as possible, and it's not a competition. When you look around these other churches, right? We shouldn't be saying, oh, this church has 400 in it, and we only have this amount in it. No, what we should be saying is, there's 400 other members of the family of God that we can connect with. There's 400 other members of the family of God that are out there doing God's work in the community because we can't do it alone here. So let's bring as many as many possible as we can. That's what we should be saying. Community over competition. God's community over competition. Right? But there's more to the verse as well. Son, he said to him, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. In other words, has God ever denied you his grace, his compassion? No. He's never once denied it to anyone who's come to him and asked for it. You're always with me, but we have to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours, he reminds him, it's not just my son, it's your brother, and we have to remember that. It's not just, oh, someone outside of our walls here. It's they are part of the family of God as well. This brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. God wants us to share the joy of others. Joy is not a selfish emotion. Remember the definition all the way back at the beginning. It's an outward thing. You should, it should show through you. And as it shows through you, we should be uplifting others up because it does show through us. Okay? You guys chuckle both times I put, I don't watch the menus, I don't know which one that is. But that guy up there, right? You laugh. You got a smile out of it. Why? Because it's joyful. Do people get a smile when they see you and not for the wrong reasons? Right? Not because you're wearing Crocs? Right? Not because you're a Tampa Bay fan? He's not here. I can do that. Do people get a smile out of you when they see you? Because they see godly joy coming through you and you're the type of person they want to be around? Because you're sharing in the joys of others? You're not 
going, I know what that person did, and I don't want to have anything to do with them, but instead you're standing there right beside of them, celebrating their accomplishments, celebrating them moving forward with their life. That's what we need to be doing. Not going, nope, nope. Look like me first. Get that whole past cleaned up first. Then come in. Because guess what? If God did that with you, we'd all be sitting out there. We'd all be wandering around completely joyless because we'd still be grabbing those things of the world that we think are going to give us joy, but only last for a little bit. They only last for a little bit. That item you buy on Amazon today, you'll forget about six months from now. Or the newer one will come out six months from now and then you'll be on Facebook trying to sell it. Right? Because worldly joy Joy that's built on the things and the materials of the world doesn't last. Godly joy lasts, and godly joy is when we celebrate with others. We have to remember this. It is so important that we don't just play the older brother. And so many of us do. So many of us play the older brother. And it's wrong. And guess what? It's not biblical. It's not. So what now? This is a story we've all been familiar with, right? It's a story that's taught in Sunday school all the way up. Even when I was stuck in that basement of the church I grew up in and didn't want to be there, I heard this story. But what can you take from it now? What different perspective can you have on it now? Well, first, as you go about this week, identify. I was waiting for someone to yell, identify what? You all playing along here? No, I'm joking. Identify the godly areas of joy in your life. Write them down. All right. I can walk up and down the aisle. Hey, Jessica. Hey. She, she didn't like that. You see the look she just gave me? She did not like that at all. <laughs> I should have waited until she had the bottle all the way up then done it, yeah. Now, what are the godly areas of joy in your life? Where do you find joy? In God, not in the materialistic things. And then more importantly, what are the areas that you overlook joy in? Where are the areas that you struggle to find joy in a godly way? Remember, we're talking about godly joy. We're not talking about worldly joy. After you do that, Include. Hey, some of you are playing along now. All right. Include godly joy in everything you do. This is the hard one, right? When you're just getting home from work and you're tired and you're grumpy, and maybe you have your kids that are being the little angels that they always are and never doing anything wrong. And all the mothers are going, well, what household are you living in? Right? This is the tough one. But we should always be showing godly joy. We should always, always, always emanate that from everything that we do. Why? Because I've seen it said many times in many different ways, and I'm probably going to butcher it. But there are times that we will be the only Bible that somebody ever reads in their life. And if you're doing this, if you're assigned to clean up a mess, but you do it with joy in your heart and do it because it is the work that God has assigned you to do, people are going to notice it. And people are going to wonder why. How can you be in this situation and still have that joy going through your life. One more. Incorporate. Getting better. This is the last one, though, so I can't give you any better than that. Now, see, every single week in this series, Pastor Andrew has had you all pull out your phones and set an alarm, right? And... and 
when he handed me this chapter, I said, Luke 15. How on earth am I going to find an alarm for 15? Right? Because I don't do military time. I don't do a time that I have to get a calculator out to figure out what time it is. All right? So I said, 15, how am I going to do this? Well, we're going to set our alarms for 3.18 in the afternoon. Or the morning if you're an overnight person, I guess. But I would not set your partner's alarm for 3.18 in the morning without telling them. All right? We're going to set our alarm for 3.18 in the afternoon. Why? Habakkuk 3.18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will take joy in the God of my salvation. This is the verse we're going to be concentrating on in 3.18 this week. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God is where I will find my joy. I will rejoice in God, and he is where I will find my joy. At 3.18 every day this week, that's what you need to be doing. Going back to remind yourself, that is where your joy comes from. It isn't from those things of the world. And more importantly, when you do take that joy from the God of your salvation, when you are taking that joy in, Make sure you're putting it out, too. Make sure that in the world, every single person that you come into contact with knows that you have godly joy running through you. Every single interaction you have. That doesn't mean you have to preach to them. That doesn't mean you have to pull the Bible out and start quoting Scripture to them. Some of your jobs probably get in trouble for doing that. Right? What that means is, How's your attitude? How is your tone of voice when you're talking to somebody? How's your facial expressions? That's the one I get called out on all the time at work. Smile, I am. All right? How are you doing that in your life? 318 every day, remind yourself of that. All right? Praise team, come on up. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for giving you, for giving us your word. And more importantly, we thank you for giving us the emotion of joy that we can express as we go about our days. Father, please allow us to not be like this second son. Allow us to be joyful and, and just rejoicing whenever somebody comes in to your family and allow us to remember that we are also responsible for helping those that come into the family we're a community we're not in competition but we're a community for you moving forward for you father in jesus name amen you all heard this one last week and i don't care if you're a bad singer or not you need to stand up clap and do this one but I'm getting out of here before he hits me with the drumsticks. <laughs>